No, the Bible has uh, some wonderful descriptions of our relationship with Jesus. And uh, I want to go to one today in, in Psalms uh, 23 and, and look at Jesus as the shepherd and we as the sheep. Uh, in Luke 15, Jesus said, uh, the good shepherd talking about himself uh, will leave the 99 and go and look for the one lost sheep. Uh, so if you, if you ever get lost, uh, Jesus is going to come looking for you and he'll leave the 99 and come looking for you. That's how important you are to your shepherd. Uh, and when he finds that sheep, it's amazing. I mean, you know, if we were up all night uh, looking for a sheep, uh, you know what you do when you find it? Probably uh, kick it or uh, put a rope around it and drag it up. That's good enough. At least you saved the sheep. Uh, but that's not Jesus, okay? Uh, he lifts that sheep up. Doesn't complain about being up all night, doesn't complain about the difficulty, and puts it on his shoulder and rejoices. Uh, and now we need to start looking at ourselves as sheep and Jesus as the shepherd. Uh, remember, we're sheep. She, uh, sheep uh, never go looking for the shepherd. It's all about the shepherd looking for the sheep, okay? Uh, and when he finds that sheep, he rejoices, and the sheep rests on his shoulders. And when he gets home, uh, he has a party and rejoices. And we've really got to understand uh, that our role is to rest on the shoulders of Jesus. Uh, there's tremendous power in peace and rest and joy from our Savior. Uh, the kingdom of heaven basically is just three things. Righteousness, peace, and joy. Those three things. And that should describe your life. It's God's gift of righteousness, not your righteousness. Your righteousness is filthy rags. Uh, and, and basically, uh, we need to see ourselves as the sheep. The sheep repented, by the way. Uh, the Bible talks about that sheep repenting. How did it repent? Repentant is metanoia, changing your mind. Uh, it repented and then it changed its mind and allowed the Savior to love it. The new covenant is all about Jesus loving us, not us loving Jesus. Do you understand that? It's all about Jesus. Uh, the Old Covenant, and we've got to see this, I think, for us to really look at the psalm this morning, uh, we've got to make a distinction in the Bible. Uh, in John 1, 17, the Bible says, Law came through Moses. Uh, that's the Ten Commandments. Grace and truth came through our shepherd, Jesus Christ. And you can't mix the two. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7 says, uh, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7 says, the law, the Ten Commandments, it's a beautiful law, no doubt about that. It's loving Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your might. But remember, uh, we're that sheep. We don't, we don't have the ability to love the way the shepherd loves. Do you understand that? Uh, and because it's law, if you make one mistake, it brings death into you. That's why 2 Corinthians 5, 3, 7 will call it the ministry of death. The Ten Commandments will not give you that joy and peace that you're looking for. In fact, it will minister death into your life. It will minister condemnation into your life. And you'll never feel comfortable in the presence of God if you're under law. Because the law points out your sin. The law actually will actually even stir sin in your life according to Romans chapter 7. Uh, the law is good. It's like that silver spoon. Uh, you know, but if we've got, we've got a vessel full of sediment at the bottom and it's all settled down, you put the spoon in and start stirring, up comes the sediment. And that's what the law will do in your life. You can't have grace and peace and joy if you're under law. Do you, do you understand that? That's so important. We're not under law. That's the first covenant. Uh, that covenant lasted until the death of Jesus. And then the new covenant came in, which is totally different. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are still under the old covenant covenant. It's Jesus speaking on earth. Uh, and a lot of things he says on the earth is to do with law. Uh, but from, from the new covenant starting with the Holy Spirit coming, and, and all the books of the New Testament written by Paul starting with, in Romans and going right through, is Jesus speaking from heaven. He's speaking the new covenant to you. Things he never spoke on earth. Like Ephesians 1 says, you have every spiritual blessing where? In Christ. You're holy, you're blameless in Jesus Christ. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It's all about the shepherd loving you. The Old Testament is all about you having to love God, and we weren't too good at doing that. Uh, if you look at Peter's life, he wasn't too good at doing that. But once he understood it was Jesus loving him, he changed totally. Do you understand that? So the Lord is our shepherd. We've really got to understand that Jesus became our our good shepherd. We will not want, you won't want for anything because it's all about how much 
He loves you. It's about all the blessings we have in Jesus Christ. Uh, it says, He makes me uh, lie down in what green pastures. Again, a beautiful picture of peace. Peace is so fundamentally important in the Bible. Every New Testament book, after the book of Acts, starts with grace and peace and ends with, with, with peace. Do you understand that? Uh, it's so important to have peace. It's so important to be at rest. Jesus said, come to me, all you are troubled and heavy laden, I'll give you what? Rest. I'll give you rest. Um, you know, uh, it, there's so much power in resting. He won't give us more work. He won't give us more condemnation. He'll give us this peace that passes all understanding. You can't even understand it. That's how important this peace is in your life. And it actually guards your heart, the Bible says. It'll help you to... to, to to, to not fall into sin. If you want to stay from, away from sin, if you want to really have a powerful Christian life, you've got to have this grace and peace that passes all understanding. Uh, you know, uh, Jesus said, if, uh, he went on to say that, that we need to carry his yoke. He said his yoke is easy and light. Uh, if Christianity is difficult to you today and it's hard, you're still under law. The New Testament grace is easy and light. Uh, and Jesus said that it's easy to be free from sin if we're under grace. Grace, in fact, teaches us to deny ungodliness. Uh, it teaches us to live a godly life. Are, are you with me so far? So important to see the difference in these two covenants. In South Africa, um, yeah, you don't have it, but we still, we still uh, plow with oxen in some of the villages. And uh, if you've got a young ox that's not at peace and it's jumping around and it's scared and it's all frightened, you know what you do? You go and find the biggest, fattest old ox and you yoke it to that ox. And, and for a while it'll jump next to the ox, but after an hour you'll see them both walking down there po- perfectly at peace. So we need to be yoked to Jesus. Jesus is the perfect example of peace. There's a storm and the boat sinking. Uh, what's Jesus doing? Sleeping. Sleeping. Uh, You know, if if your life is falling to pieces and you're in a lot of trouble, best thing to do what? Sleep. Rest. Uh, If you've got marriage problems, okay, uh, it's best if the husbands and you're in trouble with your wife, it's better to do what? Sleep. Uh, When when Adam, when God gave him Eve, he he put Adam to what? Sleep. You say to God, you did it once, you can do it again, okay? I'm going to sleep, okay? And we've got to really, really rest and let God do the work. Do you understand that? It's all about Jesus. It's all about God, the New Testament. He's a Savior, uh, and we are the people that have been saved. Do you understand that? Uh, We're the object of His love. We're the object of Him working for us. Do you understand that? That is so important. Uh, So there's a lot of power in resting. He says, He makes us lie down in green pastures. You think about it, when a sheep goes into green pastures, they normally what? They normally eat. But a sheep that is lying down is totally at peace. It's lying down there and it's regurgitating its food and it's chewing on it and it's swallowing it. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to rest and just regurgitate and think about all the beautiful things the Bible says about us. Like, think about it. In Jesus Christ is no, no, no kind of Nation, that you have every spiritual blessing, uh, that, that, that Jesus is in you, that the Holy Spirit is in you. These are the things we, need to, we can rest and really meditate and think about. Do you understand that? And, and God talks to us in a quiet, gentle voice. In Isaiah chapter 30, uh, the Assyrians are coming down from the north and, and Jerusalem's in a lot of trouble. And, and, and the prophet cries out and says, in verse 15, he says, In what? In quietness and, 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 and repentance and rest is your salvation. Repentance is always what? Changing your mind. Think about how powerful God is. He always wins battles. Now rest in that. And quietness and trust is your strength. Uh, and he said when you do that, when you're perfectly quiet, when, you, when you're at peace in your heart, you'll hear a voice, a gentle voice behind you saying, this is the way you walk in it. The Holy Spirit doesn't shout at you. Uh, with Eli- Elijah, uh, you know, God wasn't in the storm. He wasn't in the whirlwind. He was in that gentle, quiet breeze. Okay, so when you're at peace, you'll hear God talking to you. Do you, you understand that, guys? It's so important. The devil is a roaring lion. He's shouting at you. He's screaming at you. There's a lot of noise going on there. 
But you know, in, in South Africa, if a farmer is farming near where the lions are, uh, he puts his cattle in a strong enclosure and they're quite safe there. The lions never try and get them out of that enclosure. They just go up, up wind and they do what? They roar. And his cattle get so terrified and get so unfocused uh, that they either injure themselves or they break out and, the, and then lions catch them. So the devil can't hurt you. Do you understand that? Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. But the devil's shouting at you, he's screaming at you. Look at your sins, look at your bank account, look at the trouble here, look at yesterday. Roar, roar, roar. And the Holy Spirit is what? Quietly telling you, look, you have every spiritual blessing. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It says he leads us beside what? Quiet waters. The Holy Spirit is often talked about as as water. And we've really got to drink in what, what he's trying to give us. Do you understand that? In John 7, Jesus stood up at the back of the temple and, and cried out and said, If anyone is what? Thirsty, let him come to me and what? Drink. The, the New Testament is a lot of what? Drinking in of God's love. Drinking in of God's goodness. Do you understand that? The Old Testament was always demanding. Demand, demand, demand. The New Testament is what? Give, give, give. And God's giving us living waters. Uh, so, you know, the Bible says if you, if you don't know how to love people, it, we know nothing about love anyway. Uh, we, what have we got to do? We've got to drink in God's love for us. We, which the Bible says is past understanding. I mean, it's so high and it's so wide and it's so broad, according to Ephesians chapter 3, that the only way you can really understand God's love is through the Holy Spirit. Do you understand that? It passes understanding. His peace passes understanding. Do you understand that? And I, I look in the Bible and guys that have drunk this in really have a peace that passes understanding. Paul and Silas in jail in Acts chapter 16. And what are they doing? Uh, they're singing at midnight. I mean, can you imagine yourself in stocks in jail and singing at midnight? Uh, I mean, I don't know what you're facing this week at, at work. But if they can sing in jail, you can sing whatever circumstances you're facing. Do you understand that? Uh, Peter, in, in Acts chapter 12, they've just killed James. There's a lot of trouble. Here he's been a lot of persecution against the church. He's been arrested. As far as he's concerned, they're going to kill him in the morning. He's a married man. He's got kids. Lots of things to worry about. Do you know what he was doing? Sleeping. Uh, the angel even had to wake him up. I mean, that's a peace that passes what? understanding. So you've got to look for the supernatural peace. If you're having trouble forgetting somebody, if somebody's really hurt you, I, I was talking to a brother the other day, he really got hurt by somebody, he said, Doug, I can't forgive this guy, I can't forgive him. How do I, do? I said, don't try to forgive him, it's not in you to forgive, you don't have that ability, just drink in God's forgiveness. Go and look at, the, at, at how the father treated the prodigal son who had gone and wasted all his money. He got hugged, he got kissed, he got a party. Look at Jesus dying for your sins. Uh, you know. And in doing that, uh, drink that in. And this guy, after he drank it in for a little while, you know, he said, he said oh, it's easy to forgive this guy because I suddenly realized how much forgiveness has come my way. Uh, you know, if you're having trouble having peace, don't try and get peace. Just drink in God's peace. Just uh, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. You can't command those things. I can't command you like, rejoice right now, I tell you, rejoice. It, it doesn't work, okay? Have peace right now. It doesn't work. You've got you to know God and you've got to drink these things in from God and then they flow out of you. And the more you drink in God's peace, the more it flows out of you. So it's all about looking at Jesus. Do you understand that? It's all about taking from him. When you take from him, you actually refresh him. Do you understand that? The woman uh, by the well uh, in, in John chapter 4, I mean, she had, she'd been divorced five times. Uh, and she was sleeping with a guy that wasn't her husband. Can, can you imagine that? The Bible says Jesus had to go through Samaria. It's in, it's in the imperative in the Greek. In other words, he's a savior. Saviors have got to do what? They've got to save. Uh, and he goes there and he's tired from the journey. And he starts talking to this woman. And he actually, in, in, this, uh, in the old covenant, Jesus could forgive sins uh, uh, while he was on earth. And obviously he forgave her her sins, he gave her back her dignity, and she ran into the village and shared her faith. That's what grace does. Grace gives us the power to do the right thing. Do you understand that? Uh, and when the disciples came back to Jesus, he said, look, I don't need your food. I've been refreshed because I've given to somebody. God, the shepherd God, 
He rejoiced when he found the sheep. The, the, the father rejoiced when the son came back. So you want to make Jesus happy, just take from him. Do you understand that? In, in, the, in Matthew, Jesus is crying over Jerusalem. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you know, I wanted to gather you the way a mother hen gathers her, her chickens, but you wouldn't. You were so busy fasting, praying, doing all the stuff that you're trying to serve me, and you wouldn't let me serve you. Do you understand that? You've got to let God serve you. If you, if you. Like, for example, Peter said to Jesus, you're not going to wash my feet. And, and Jesus said, look, I've got no, you're not going to have any part of me unless you let me serve you. Do you understand that? Faith is learning to take from God. Do you understand that? He's a cheerful giver. The Bible says, those receive what? The abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness or what? Will reign in life. So the more grace, you, if, you, if you're struggling with sin right now, just take in God's grace and the gift of His righteousness. So the psalm says, He makes us lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside quiet waters. He restores our soul. He leads us in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. This is so important, guys. The New Testament covenant is, is, a, is a ministry of righteousness. It's not a ministry of condemnation. Uh, I think the most important scripture in this is in, in, in um, 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, uh, God made him who knew, who knew no sin to be what? Sin on our behalf that we might become what? The righteousness. The righteousness of, of who? Of God in Christ Jesus. I mean, as you said, this is, this is so important. You, you're the sheep sitting out there and I'm the sheep. Do we see ourselves as righteous as God? I mean, how many of us in this room this morning see ourselves as holy as God and as righteous as God? Think about it. What does that verse say? It says, He made him and you know sin. Let, let's go through that a little bit. Jesus knew what? No sin. He could stand before his enemies in John 8 and say, Which one of you convicts me of? Sin. And they had to what? Walk away from him. I mean, I couldn't even do that among my best friends. Uh, you know, Pilate, and there was a lot of racial hatred in, 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 uh, in, in, in Jerusalem at that time. The Romans hated the Jews, and yet Jesus is a Jew and Pilate is a Roman, and, and he's doing his best to release Jesus. In the end, he says what? He washes his hands and he said, this man's, I'm innocent of this man's blood. In other words, he couldn't find fault in Jesus. Send him to Herod. Herod couldn't find fault. The Roman soldier who, who crucified people, can you imagine that kind of job, uh, said this man is what? Innocent. And of course the father said Jesus was innocent. Yet he became what? He became our sins. Long before you were born, God knew your sins. God's the I am. He knows sin. He's outside of time. He knows what you're going to do tonight, all the bad things you're going to do tomorrow. And he took all those bad things and put them where into Jesus. And Jesus became the worst sinner on the cross. We talk about Hitler being a bad sinner. Jesus became the sin of the world on the cross. Do you understand that? And God treated him not as a righteous man, but as what? As a sinner. If you want to see how God thinks about your sins, look at what the law demands, okay? When the Roman soldiers beat Jesus, they beat him so badly that they took all the flesh off his bones. They plowed furrows in his back. Psalms 129. Psalms 22, you could just see white bones when they'd finished beating him. Mel Gibson, as I often say, came under a lot of criticism about his movie. Uh, and you know what Mel said? You guys have never read your Bible. Because Isaiah says, never was a man so marred as Jesus was. And, and, the, and they were beating Jesus on behalf of who? Those Roman soldiers. On behalf of Rome? On behalf of the Jews? No, on behalf of God. Uh, that's how much God hates your sins. God will not tolerate sin. And the cross hadn't even started yet. Uh, Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 2 says, Those Roman soldiers beat Jesus on behalf of God. By His stripes we are what? Healed. Then, then they, they took Him and they stripped Him naked and He became what? A shame for all of us, the Bible says, that we can take His double honor. Do you understand that? At 9 o'clock in the morning they put Him on the cross. And he's still calling God, what? Father, Abba Father. Father, forgive them, they know not what they're doing. At 12 noon it goes what? It goes dark and God starts what? Cursing Jesus. Isaiah, uh, Isaiah at least, Deuteronomy says, when it goes dark at noon, God does what? He curses. And, for th and Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you what? Forsaken me. And for three solid hours in darkness, God cursed Jesus because he became our sins. At the end of it, he said it's what? Finished. 
Your sins are what? Gone. Do you, Guys, it's so important we understand that we need to have a good, clean conscience. This is the power that overcomes sin in our lives if we believe these things. He was buried the third day, he was raised what? Without your sin. Do you understand that? Jesus is now at the right hand of God with your sin or without your sin? Without our sin. Do you understand that, guys? So important to understand that. 1 John 4 7, he says, As he now is, so are we were in this world. How is Jesus now? Totally without sin, and we are totally without sin. This is so important to believe that, guys. Otherwise, you're not going to walk away from sin. It's the grace of God that teaches us what? To deny ungodliness. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we, next time you sing, Romans 8 21 says, Romans 8 1 says, there is now no, there is, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Is is in what tense in the English? In the now tense, okay? Is now. Now means what? Now. That, that, that verse is always in the present tense. What about next time you're sinning? Is it in the present tense? It is. It, there is therefore now no condemnation. I've seen guys walk in, in South Africa. We have, we, there's a, one of the ministers came and he was so excited because he had 16 guys in his congregation that were totally hooked on pornography, believe it or not. And they've been trying so hard to, to get rid of this. They, they've been praying about it. They've been fasting about it. They've been confessing it. And they haven't got rid of it. They started to realize that as they're looking at pornography, there, there is now what? Now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And they started to realize they had God's righteousness and they were still holy. And Jesus was the doctor and he was still with them and he still loved them. And, and, and they were still clean because they had whose righteousness? His righteousness. And they started confessing this and believing it. You know, after two weeks, every one of those guys were off, didn't, couldn't, they'd said, this stupid sin, how could we even do this? Uh, you know, because they realized they were righteous, they were holy. You've got to get your identity right. Do you understand that? It is so important. The devil is what? An identity thief. Uh, he's going to make you feel dirty. He's going to roar at you. He's going to make you call yourself a Christian. Look at this, and you're confessing it, and you're thinking of dirt all the time. You need to start thinking of what? Righteousness. I'm still holy. Do you, uh, uh, the Spirit of God is still in me. You look at Second at First Corinthians, the church was in a lot of sin there. What's Paul doing? He says, you guys are saints. Don't you know you're going to the temple of the Holy Spirit? Don't you know that Jesus is your, is your righteousness? Don't you know that you're still holy? And, and he's bringing them back to their identity. That is so important. When Jesus was baptized, God said, this is my beloved son, I'm well pleased. The devil said, if you are the son of God. He tried to take away Jesus' identity. And Jesus said, no, you've left out one word. I'm the beloved son of God. You left out the word beloved. Uh, you, as you sit here this morning, it's so important to, for you to believe with all your heart, it's your faith that overcomes your sins, that you are the beloved, righteous daughter of God. Because Jesus became the wicked evils of your sin on the cross, you become His righteousness. Do you understand it? He became your sin without having to do your sins. You become His righteousness without having to do, to do His righteousness. It's given to you as a gift. But you've got to take that gift by faith. And that will empower you to stop sinning. Do you understand that? So our shepherd leads us in the paths of what? Righteousness for His name's sake. You look at the New Covenant, the Holy Spirit in Ephesians, the first three chapters is leading you in the paths of what? Righteousness. It says you have, Ephesians 1 says you have every spiritual blessing in Christ. Do you believe that? We say God bless me. He said, no, you've got every blessing. God bless you more. Uh, you know, you're holy and blameless. He sees you. God sees you as holy and blameless. I mean, do you understand? The Holy Spirit, if He saw sin in your life, what would He do to you? Kill you. Do you understand that? You know that from the Old Testament because he lived in the Holy of Holies. Uh, if you walked into the Holy of Holies and there wasn't the Day of Atonement and you didn't have blood and you weren't high priest, you were a dead man. Do you understand that? Now he lives where? He lives in your body. So where does he see your sins? He sees your sins on the cross. God can't see your sins on the cross and in you at the same time. Do you understand that? He can't curse Jesus and you for your sins. Do you understand that? It's called double jeopardy in law. 
He's righteous. He's holy. You are righteously legally saved. Do you understand that? Because Jesus became legally your sin. He paid the legal price for your sin, which is cursing. And therefore, you are legally free. Do you understand that? It's not because of God says, oh, I'm going to love you. He, he let Jesus die because he loved you. But now because he's righteous, you're saved. You're righteous because of the legal transaction. Do you understand that? God in his righteousness says, I'm righteous in forgiving Doug Lightning because I righteously punished his sins on the cross. And therefore, I'm finished with my anger. I can only love him now. Do you understand that? The Bible says God can't even get angry with you. Isaiah 54 verse 9. Do you understand? He took an oath. He can't get angry with you because he got angry with who? With Jesus. You see that in Abraham because the blood of Jesus went both ways. Uh, you know, Abraham lied about his wife. He said, this is my sister. I mean, that, that's, that's not being too... And he was a coward. The Bible says all cowards and liars were are going to hell. That come under a curse. But Jesus became Abraham's curse. And that night, God went to the kid, one of them and said, you're a dead man. Who was he talking to? The king or Abraham? Talking to the king. Told the king, you go to Abraham, he's a prophet. God said, no, God, you got the wrong guy. Abraham's the liar. No, Jesus became Abraham's lying. Jesus became Abraham's cowardness on the cross. And Abraham became Jesus' righteousness. So God saw no sin in Abraham. He saw the sin in the king because the king had no faith. Do you understand that? Uh, when Balaam was going to curse Jacob, uh, God, uh, God spoke to Jay, uh, J- uh, Balaam and said, uh, when he was going to curse Israel, uh, he said, I see no sin in Jacob. I mean, Jacob was a, was a sleazy character. <laughs> I mean, he was a horrible guy. He liked his old father and, and, and was just a nasty guy. Because he had faith, God saw no sin in him because Jesus took his, his sins to the cross as well. Do you understand that? So you've got to have this clean conscience. The blood of Christ cleanses our conscience, guys, from dead works to serve the living God. If you're struggling with sin today, don't go back under law. It'll just stir sin. You understand that? Come under grace, and grace will cleanse your conscience. It'll tell you who you are in Christ, and it'll empower you to overcome sin. You understand that? So it leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Then it says, uh, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I feel, I feel no what? Evil. I mean, death is called what in the Bible? A shadow. I mean, uh, you know, if somebody's scared of shadows, then, then they really are a scary person. Do you understand that? I mean, we should not be scared of death anymore. We, we've passed out of life, uh, out of death into life in Jesus Christ. When you were baptized, that was your what? Funeral. Do you understand that? And that's why baptism is so beautiful. We are buried with Christ in the waters of baptism. We are crucified with Him and we are raised, what? To walk in a new life. Uh, so this body is just what? It's just a, a tent, okay? I mean, we'll get out of this body one day. But death is, should have no fear. We, well, the Hebrews 2 says He's taken away what? The fear of death. You understand that? Uh, in fact, it can be quite exciting to be going home to be with God, okay? If you died this afternoon and you're in Christ, where are you going to end up? You're going to be with Jesus, okay? You're going to be in heaven. Uh, and, 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 I mean, it gets, it gets exciting. I mean, how many of us woke up this morning excited about dying? Uh, no, seriously, guys, don't laugh. Don't laugh. I mean, uh, if you were going to go on, on a fantastic vacation to Florida or something tonight, you, you'd be excited about that. I mean, I'll tell you, heaven is better than Florida. Do you understand that? And heaven doesn't fade away. We've got to start opening our eyes and see what this is all about. You'll see God, okay? Who's this God? Isaiah 40 says, He spoke the universe into what? Existence. And, and, this, and just start thinking. Meditate like that sheep in the pastures. Think about these things. We live in, in, in the Milky Way galaxy. It's got a, a hundred billion stars bigger than the sun or about the same size as the sun and the sun's bigger than the earth. And there's billions of galaxies, okay? It's so big, scientists say there's got to be life out there because the universe is so big. No, God said it's not because of life. It says, that is my measuring rod. We measure in kilometers. We measure in miles. God measures in what? In galaxies. Uh, and, and, he, and he told Job, that's nothing. That's the fringes of my word. Whereas it, it cost him five words, the galaxies. Do you understand that? That's how powerful our God is. And you're going to be what? You're going to be with Him tonight. You're seated with who? Jesus. 
Uh, not in the cheap seats at the back, okay? Uh, you, and the angels would just love to change places with you. There'd be no more dying, no more pain, and you'll just see this amazing God in all of His holiness and all of His beauty, and, and you'll see the angels, you'll see Jesus, okay? Uh, and you can't get excited about that. <laughs> you know, what can excite you, guys? Uh, you know... Now, go and read Fox's Book of Martyrs, those first century Christians, as they faced death, as they went into fire, okay? Uh, they, they were, in the Inquisition, they burned these guys, okay? For a couple of hours, make the twigs nice and green so they would take a few hours of burning. You know what those guys were doing in fire? Singing. I mean, surely, guys, if, the, if our brothers and sisters could do that, we could do the same. You've just got to get our belief right. Do you understand that? Open up your eyes and see you've got an amazing Savior. You've got an amazing God, and you're amazingly saved in Jesus Christ. There's a new covenant here with better promises. Do you understand that? Focus on that, okay? It says, uh, it, it, it says, he, 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 Although I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I fear no evil. Then it talks about spreading a table before, 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 before him. And we're seated at his table, do you understand that? And when we take the Lord's Supper, I think it's a great time to remind us what we have in Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? Look at your faith and see, do you really believe you have every spiritual blessing? Do you really believe that, that there's no condemnation in your life? Do you really believe that as Jesus is, so you are in this world? That's what you should be thinking about, okay? It's our faith that matters. Uh, you know, when Jesus healed people on the earth, he only asked them one question. Uh, not, did you have a good quiet time? Or how was your, did you go to the temple? Or how much did you give? One question, how is your faith? Do you believe? Do you understand that? So guys, work on your faith. Work on your belief. And, and, and the Bible says, faith has joy and what? peace in believing. You'll know your face coming right when you've got a lot of joy and a lot of peace and you start realizing, hey, God's my Abba Father and Jesus is my Savior and the Holy Spirit lives in me. I'm awesomely and wonderfully saved. Do you understand that? I was a wonderful child of God. Uh, he prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Don't worry about the devil, okay? The devil's power has been taken away from him. Do you understand that? Jesus has how much authority? All authority in heaven and earth, okay? He works everything together for what? Good. I mean, when you should have a peace that passes. And when you wake up in the morning, you should say, God, whatever happens today, you're going to work it out for what? Good. Even if I have a motor wreck today, or even if I find out good news about my health, bad news about my health, my bank balance is not good, God's going to work it out for what? Good. He'll do that. Ask Joseph. Joseph had a lot of bad things in a, in a dungeon at the bottom of, of an Egyptian jail. Next minute, he's... God worked it out for good, okay? Every situation God works out for what? Good. Even, even the sinful situations in Joseph's life where his brothers sinned against him, God still worked it out for good. Uh, the cross is the you know, ideal example of that. So, so he, in everything that happens, God's going to work it out for good. And then it says, goodness and mercy reward will follow me all the days of my life. I love the Hebrew there. The Hebrew says, not follow, it says, hunt me down. Okay? You're being hunted, okay? Uh, you know, those of us who are hunted, you know, you we get very focused. I watch a lion hunting in Africa. It's totally focused on getting that antelope. Do you understand that? It's thinking of nothing else. Goodness is mercy is thinking of nothing else but hunting you what? Down, okay? God wants to give you goodness. He wants to give you mercy. He's given you Jesus. I mean, what more can He give you? As, as Romans 8 says, you're free to give us what? All things, okay? So guys, think about this. We're under a new covenant with a new sav- with a Savior uh, who loves us. It's not about how much you love God. It's about how much you, He loves you. John says, in this is love. Not that we love God. That's the Old Testament. But that He first loved us. So go to Ephesians 3. Meditate on that. And think about how much God loves you. Try to figure out love which you can't understand. Try, try and let the Holy Spirit write peace that you can't understand. And joy that you can't understand. And then be like Paul and Silas and sing in jail or whatever happens this week. Sing. Okay, thanks guys.